Hey everyone, Sweet Johnny Cage here. Welcome to part one of the Dark Souls 3 full playthrough walkthrough. This is a Let's Play style walkthrough, so I'll be talking and playing as I record, so it's a little bit live. I'll do my best to clean up any background noise that you might hear, but you may hear some things. It's just the way it is. Think of it like a stream with no camera and slightly edited. Uh, so the purpose of this walkthrough, just like all the other Dark Souls walkthroughs and Bloodborne walkthrough and <laughs> Returnal walkthrough that I've done so far, is to make a a game that is often perceived as really brutally difficult. I'm here to show you that it's not, and that it's very manageable. It's punishing for sure, and it's really a game about learning from your mistakes and persevering, but it's not as brutal as like the media and fans sometimes make it seem. It is an accessible game, but you have to respect it. And that's just sort of the, the ethos of the Soul series, and basically all from software games in general. So let's start off. Um, in part one of the walkthrough, we will be going through the Cemetery of Ash, which is basically like the intro area of the game. We'll be fighting Udex Gundir, who's the first boss, and then we will be doing some adventuring around Firelink Shrine. So let's go ahead and start a new game. Um, I will take some time to sort of explain the mechanics of everything, so we'll call this guy Guide, to keep uh, in, in line with how we've been doing things. So. Trying to remember if I did male or female for Bloodborne. You think it was male in Bloodborne, if I'm not mistaken. So let's go ahead and make this character female. We'll be doing uh, a knight. This is just the basic class of the game. I assume most people are going to choose this, so that's why I'm doing it. Um, for the burial gift, this is your starting gift. Uh, the life ring is pretty good, but you get it kind of early on in the game through other means. Divine Blessing is a use once item. I don't ever recommend taking this or the Hidden Blessing. Black Fire Bomb is a bit of a waste. The Fire Jam is what we're going to pick, uh, but I'll go over the others. Sovereignless Soul is just a way to give yourself some more souls. The Rusted Gold Coin increases luck, but you can buy these later on. The Cracked Red Eye Orb is if you want to basically start off invading people right away. Uh, and then the Young White Branch uh, is sort of like a... It's the chameleon spell in an item. And again, you can get these much later. So the fire gem is really important uh, for not necessarily this part of the walkthrough, but the next one. Okay, so I don't worry about any of the... You know, is there, if there's a random one, maybe we can just sort of fool around. Nah, it doesn't look like there is. That's okay. All right, so let's finalize our creation. And then we will begin the game in the Cemetery of Ash. So before we sort of get started with, you know, combat and everything, I should tell you how this walkthrough will sort of work. Uh, here in the first walkthrough, I'll go over basically all the mechanics of the game as far as I can. Um, some of them are locked until later, but I'll at least talk about them. Um, and unlike Dark Souls 1 and Bloodborne, uh, Dark Souls 3 bars from Dark Souls 2 in the sense that you can finish the game and not go to New Game Plus right away. You can just sort of beat the last boss and then just continue on as you were. You don't have to go to New Game Plus right away. So because of that, we are going to uh, complete the entire game through however many parts that takes of this walkthrough. And then we will begin the DLC starting. We'll do those in order. So we'll do Ashes of Ariandel and then the Ring City. So, yeah, we're not going to have to skip around at all. Um, OK, so starting off, I should just introduce you to the combat of Souls games in case this is your first. So I'm playing on a PlayStation. So my binds are like, you know, X, circle, square, triangle, or cross. Um, so if you're playing on Xbox, you know, just change the inputs in your head. Um, so combat is pretty simple in Souls games for the most part. R1 is your basic attack. R2 is a stronger attack, and you can often hold R2, uh, but it does cost more stamina. And then L1 is uh, to use the sort of normal attack in your left hand if you're using a shield, it's to hold the shield up. Also, if you're using a shield, L2 will deflect or parry. Um, I will tell you right now, the speed of the combat in Dark Souls 3 is much faster than Dark Souls 1 and 2. It sort of borrows from Bloodborne a little bit, so they made it a bit faster. And so my preferred playstyle in Dark Souls 3 is to use uh, big, heavy, two-handed weapons because they're a little bit faster than they were in the other games, so I find them a bit uh, more entertaining to use. As a result, I'm not great at parrying in Dark Souls 3. I'll just straight up tell you that right now. In Dark Souls 1 and Bloodborne, I'm sort of like a parrying monster. I, I know how to parry literally any enemy, um, but I don't do it very much in Dark Souls 3. And 
not too far into this walkthrough, I'm going to ditch my shield pretty much completely. Um, so just forewarning on that. Um, yeah, so another thing that was added in uh, Dark Souls 3 was weapon arts. And this is sort of building on a previous system in Dark Souls 2. Um, okay, great. So this weapon does have a weapon art. So you'll notice that I'm two-handing my weapon. You do that by pressing triangle. And then if you hold L2, you can charge your weapon. And then depending on what you do next, changes what happens. So you can either press R1 to do one sort of attack or R2 to do a different type of attack. But both of these use FP or mana. So that's the blue bar underneath your health. So R1 is sort of a scoop. This has a chance of actually lifting enemies off the ground and sort of throwing them. And then R2 is just a big lunge into sort of like a bigger scoop. But again, that uses FP. So that's sort of weapon arts. All different types of weapons have all different types of weapon arts. <laughs> I'm a pretty basic combat person, so I don't rely too heavily on them, but it is a really, really neat feature of Dark Souls 3 and a nice uh, way to build upon the combat. So I'll show you parrying now. The general rule or the general idea for parrying, my big tip, is to watch the enemy's hand. And when the enemy's hand starts moving towards you, that's when you press L2 to execute a parry. That said, I'm using a pretty slow shield. So this, this may not go super well. Nope, I don't like that one. <laughs> nope. Oh my god. Come on, dude. Yeah, my shield is so slow. I'm, I might die to this guy. That'd be really funny. Let's try it one more time. Let me back up and heal. I really can't believe I can't parry this dude. I can believe it, actually. I've tried... I've recorded this part of the walkthrough a few times, and I'm just sort of realizing, like, I didn't, uh, like, go over certain mechanics certain times, so I wanted to redo it. But, yeah, like I said, parrying really is not my strong suit in Dark Souls 3, and I feel like I'm really exemplifying that here now. I feel like I gotta do it so much earlier than I think. Let me try to drink again. Try one more time. There we go. Okay, so that's a parry. And then once you hear the sound, you press R1 to repost. Again, I'm not great at parrying in Dark Souls 3. If you've watched my other walkthroughs, you should know that I do know how to parry in the other games. <laughs> Alright, so this guy drops a Cleric Sacred Chime. And Chimes are used to cast Miracles. I don't have any Miracles right now, but in case I did, you would equip the Chime along with your spell, and then you'd be able to cast it. Okay, so in this little... For boss here, we have uh, Soul of a Deserted Warrior, I think it said. All right, and then this corpse is very, very important. Oh, hello. This corpse is really important. It has the Ashen Estus Flask, and the Ashen Estus Flask restores FP. And in Dark Souls 3, um, there is a sort of like balancing mechanic that, I'll, that I will explain once we get into Firelink Shrine. Um, and this balance mechanic allows you to choose how many Estus flasks you carry and how many Ashen Estus flasks you carry. And it's done from the same pool of flasks. So what that means is eventually, you know, throughout the game, the maximum amount of flasks total you'll be able to carry is 15. That means you can carry 15 regular Estus flasks and zero S Ashen Estus flasks, or you can do um, any combination of the two. So one in 14, two in 13, three in 12, and so on and so forth. And you do that at Firelink Shrine. Uh, so we can go ahead and drink that to restore our, our FP. All right. We're going to come over here. And I'm actually going to see if I can backstab this guy. I'm not sure if he'll uh, wake up. But Yeah, so if you sneak up behind enemies and then press R1, you can get a backstab. And it's basically like a guaranteed free critical. Um, you know, just a ton of damage really fast. Oh, boy. Yeah, how you doing? All right. So kill this guy. And then I'm going to risk it, and we're going to go kill the Crystal Lizard. Um, that said, though, I'm actually hesitant. There's a bonfire right past here. Yeah, let's just be safe. <laughs> I'll introduce you to the first bonfire. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll backtrack and kill the Crystal Lizard. Had it not taken me so long to show you how to parry in this game, uh, that wouldn't have taken so long. I wouldn't have lost so much health. All right, let's go ahead and light it, and then we can rest at the bonfire. And resting at bonfires restores all of your flasks, including your uh, Ashen Estus flask as well. Uh, but again, you cannot change your allotment of either Estus or Ashen Estus uh, until you reach Firelink Shrine. And then you will always have to return to Firelink Shrine anytime you want to do it. Hello. This guy's again. 
la. Hello. Okay, so through here, there's a little arena with a giant crystal lizard. And um, the crystal lizard drops, uh, I think, a demon titanite or dragon scale or something like that. Uh, so nothing incredibly useful to us right now, but it's still, you know, something you should get. Uh, that is the most devastating attack you have to look out for, is that roll. So just be on the lookout for that. And also, you can stun this enemy. Just like that. And then, if you can, yep, you can time it and get a repost, which deals about 300 damage for the night. So just sort of be on the lookout. Anytime you hear, like, maybe, like, a strange noise or something while fighting something, and the enemy gets staggered, chances are that means you're you're able to get a free critical for, like, a repost. This enemy also has a tail whip, which I'm a little surprised he hasn't done yet. Oh, there it is. Yep, there's the tail whip. And look out for that. And then we can end it with a repost. Great. So I didn't need that refill after all, but that's okay. All right, so we get a tight knight scale. And then don't forget the other item in this little arena here. It's on this corpse. Soul of an Unknown Traveler. Great. Okay, so now let's go ahead and return to that uh, bonfire. And we can carry on. So we already have 4,000 souls, which is really good. Be able to level up quite a bit uh, before we uh, even go into the first quote-unquote real area of the game. Let me just kill this guy for posterity. How you doing, buddy? All right, great. Okay, let's go ahead and rest. And then we will make our way, or we'll clear out the area before the first boss. Okay. Okay, great. Cool. Oh, hello. Uh, I'm actually f recording all of this just before a, uh, oh my god, there he is. Just before a, uh, the Return to Lothric event. So the Return to Lothric event uh, is basically like the Dark Souls 3 subreddit's um, call to to all of its members to play through the game again. So if you're part of that, hello. All right, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do a plunging attack, which returns from Dark Souls 1 and 2. It was not in Demon Souls, so if, if this is your first game after Demon Souls, this game has plunging attacks. Which means that you can fall off of a ledge and press R1, and you can basically do like a downward stabbing attack. And that allows you to kill uh, tough enemies really quickly, if you can sort of get the jump on them. And that spear enemy is kind of a pain to deal with, so I always recommend doing that plunging attack on him. Good night. Okay, and then we're going to come back up here, because now we got to do a jump to get a treasure. So there is a treasure on this sarcophagus over here. So we just need to jump off. Great. Tight Knight Shard for upgrading. Wonderful. And the way you jump is, um, you know, I'm not sure what the default is, actually. Um, okay, so it's either L3 or Circle. I prefer Circle, just because that's how I learned on the original. Basically, you hold your Run button and then double tap it. Or you let go of it, then tap it really quick. And then... Uh, you will jump, yeah, as long as you were running prior. Alright, so this door leads to, or sorry, this door leads to the first boss, Udex Gundir, which I believe is Latin for Judge, um, or Judge Gundir. So, uh, the really interesting thing about Udex Gundir is you can parry him. Um, so I'll show you how to do that. It's hard. Uh, I may fail. <laughs> I don't think I'll die, but I may fail. Uh, the other thing, too, is that you should have picked up fire bombs. Um, which are right here. Go ahead and equip these because you can see the sort of like black corruption oozing out of the boss. And uh, basically what that indicates is that at some point when he gets basically below 50% HP, he's going to transform. And when this guy transforms, he transforms. Uh, luckily, he's weak to fire, but also you can just sort of like get in on him and he doesn't have many close ranged attacks while he is in that transformed state. He can still kill you you know, don't get cocky or anything, but uh, he's less scary than he looks. Okay, so go ahead and remove the coiled sword, and then he will wake up. But as he's waking up, you can actually attack him, so don't be afraid to do so. There you go. Some beautiful damage on him. 
Okay. He has a grab, so be careful of that. But like I said, you can parry him. You can you can repost him as well. I don't think you can actually push him off. Oh yeah, that shoulder slam sucks. Oh god. So he's going to transform here. Yep, there he goes. All right, so go ahead and take out your fire bombs, and then you want to start chucking him. Like you said, he's fairly weak to fire, so it, it helps. Oh god, I'm very stunned. Yeah, so the big snake thing is rough to look at, but like I said, he's not as scary as he looks. Just keep throwing fire bombs. He can cover a lot of ground. Yep, there you go. He can cover a lot of ground really quickly. When he does that, though. Uh, he's actually pretty vulnerable. He's going to attack the other way. So just sort of keep that in mind. Alright. Ooh, yeah. Big slam. I need that. Okay, so all out of fire bombs now. That's quite alright. I am sort of holding my shield here. Just to be safe. Two more hits, and he's three more hits, and he's down. So that is Udex Gundir. He's the intro boss of the game. You cannot skip him, at least through normal means. You do have to fight him. And after we kill him, we get the Coiled Sword. Okay. So, we also have our Ember Restored. And this happens anytime you beat a boss. So if you're coming here from Demon Souls, welcome. Um, but Ember is really similar to um, uh, Spirit Form and Body Form. In that you're either Kindled or Unkindled. So it, you start off Unkindled, and anytime you beat a boss, you Kindle. Um, you can kindle yourself by using an ember, which we'll pick up in a little while. Um, but when you are kindled, you are opened up to online play. So you can either summon folks into your world, or they can invade you. Uh, what I really recommend doing um, is very similar to how humanity works in Dark Souls 1. When you use a humanity, or when you use an ember in this game, uh, your health gets completely restored from 1 to 100. So like, if you're like struggling on a boss, don't use embers until you like kind of figure out the pattern of the boss. Uh, but I do recommend using an ember first as your first heal. So like just let the boss, don't let him kill you or anything, but, or her, but you know, just don't use an Estus flask until you get really low on HP, then use an ember and then start using your Estus flask. It's just sort of a way to like maximize your healing in tough fights. Okay. So now that Udex Gundir is down, we can go ahead and wander around the little intro area of Firelink Shrine. There's a lot of pretty views and everything. This is the High Wall of Lothric over here, which is the next area. Okay, so I'm gonna show you the kick mechanic here. I'm just gonna be following me. So in Dark Souls 3, just like Dark Souls 1 and Demon Souls as well, uh, you have a kick. So in order to kick, you just press forward and R1 at the same time and you kick. It does cost a decent amount of stamina though, so you gotta be careful. Um, but you can just kick enemies off of ledges, just like this. See you later. And that is a mechanic we're going to abuse in a few minutes. So, oh, hello. Oh my god. Hello. Great. Right, get ourselves a fading soul. And then there's treasure over here. It's over here. Sorry about that. <laughs> you get the drop on this guy again. This is my camp. There we go. Yeah, it's a weird drop right there. Alright, cool. There's a treasure down here. Great. That's a homeward bone. Same purpose, or same use as in Dark Souls 1. I think they were in Dark Souls 2 as well. It's been a long time since I played Dark Souls 2. I don't think they changed, though. Okay. Cool. So what we are going to do is we're going to come over here to the left side first. We're not going to go into Firelink Shrine just yet. But we're going to get close. Okay, so come over here to the left side. And there are a couple of enemies over here that we want to kill. But then there is a special enemy known as the Firelink Shrine Unkindled. He's referred to in the official strategy guide. Um, it's this guy right here. 
And so this guy has a Yuji Katana, and this is how you get the Yuji Katana in the game, by killing him. Uh, but he's really strong, and he's not really meant to be killed right now, but you can do so somewhat easily by kicking him off the ledge. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to aggro him, but you want to make sure you're blocking. You don't want to try to really deal with this guy at all, because he's going to... He has a really sick weapon arc, just like that, where he's going to sort of zoom towards us. Yep, just like that. Oh, God. And he can cause you to bleed. So you got to try to, like, get him over here. Hey, how you doing? Ugh, damn, dude. Really my ass. Oh, man. Jesus. Wow, I can't get a kick in. This, okay, so I'm actually going to abandon this for now, because uh, I don't want to have to run all the way back. So what I, I'm going to come into Firelink Shrine right here, and uh, we're going to, like, sort of light this bonfire and then go back and deal with them. Just quicker this way. Okay, so we can embed the coiled sword. Uh, you have to do this from a specific spot. Like, you gotta do it in the proper spot. Otherwise, the prompt won't come up. So, uh, yeah, just make sure you're doing that. And then we can rest at the bonfire. Okay, cool. So, now that we've done that, let's go ahead and leave the shrine really fast. Okay, great. And then we'll just kill these two guys again. And we'll try again with our friend here. This historically does take me a few attempts because sometimes he just acts really fast and will sort of surprise you. Alright, come on, buddy. Be sick if he just jumped off, right? Save me so much time. There you go. Oh no, come on, I was so close. Should drink again. You just keep spamming the kick. Just be careful because you can run out of stamina while doing it, just like I did. Oh my god, dude. He, like, is able to clip into the floor there. It's pretty crazy. That's okay. We'll get him. That's why we light this bonfire. All right, so here's something interesting. I'm actually not going to cut this out. At least on console, this happens. I'm not sure if it always happens on PC, but sometimes Firelink Shrine loads closed, and so you just have to wait for this fog to go away. Um, there's really no way around it. <laughs> you just have to wait. Sometimes you can like run around and then eventually it'll lift, but it also uh, covers the side exit as well. Yeah, so now it's gone. Great. Thank you. Alright, let's try this again. I got him so close that time. That was crazy. I don't know if these guys ever really wake up, but I don't like taking the chance. I don't want to deal with uh, Mr. Samurai guy over here. All right, how you doing, buddy? Welcome back. Welcome back to the stage of history. Oh, God. God and baby Jesus. Are you kidding me? How did that kick not connect? Oh, man, this is, this is a mess. Okay, just slash them off. Okay, wait for the souls to collect. You get 2,000 for your troubles. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to teach you the reload mechanic of this game. So that guy will always, 100% of the time, drop the Yuji Katana sword. But if you kick an enemy off of a cliff or they, you know, fall through the geometry or something, um, you won't get their item most of the time. And if that happens, all you have to do is reload your game just by quitting. And then just mash your way through the title screens. Okay. And then we hit continue. And then basically what this is going to do is 
it, it forces the world to reload, and any items that have not been picked up will return to their spawn location, or the spawn location of the enemy who were to drop it. So what this means is that the Ichigatana is just going to be at our feet now, right here, because this is where the guy spawns. So you get the Ichigatana, the Master's Attire, and the Master's Gloves. Uh, this door you cannot open from this side, but yeah, there are useful items in there, and that room kind of sucks, but it's going to be a little while before we get to it. Oh, there's a treasure here. East-West Shield, nice. Didn't know about that. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and explore a little bit more outside of Firelink Shrine. The walkthrough really is not close to over. Yeah, just heads up. There's a lot more to talk about. Um, okay. So there's going to be a dog somewhere. I swear to God, there's a dog somewhere. <laughs> Alright, some homeward bone. This dog is just going to straight jump me. I know he is. Oh, there it is. Alright. Get another ember. Also, uh... So, while you are unkindled, you have less health. I completely forgot about that. I should mention that. Okay, so that's sort of all the items out here. Um, but, we are nowhere close to done yet. So, before I even start explaining the mechanics of inside Firelink Shrine and all the systems and NPCs available there, we're going to continue outside. So, there's this side exit here. And then there's a suspicious-looking tree. If you've played Dark Souls 2, this is a giant tree. Um, and this guy will uh, drop... Um, seeds of the giant or giant seeds, something like that. Basically, they are sh seeds that you can use while you have been invaded and it will make it so enemies in your world attack invaders. So it was a mechanic introduced in Dark Souls 2 and it has carried over here into Dark Souls 3. Um, the dropping of seeds here is random. Uh, there are ways to manipulate it. Basically, every time you get invaded, um, there is like a 10% chance increase of it dropping up to 50%. And then basically, like, any time you die, just return to the tree, and it may show up, may not. Okay, there's a door here. This is locked. You need the tower key in order to open it. However, um, there is a way to not have the tower key and sort of explore most of this area. And that is by using this tree. This tree has weird geometry, as you can see here, sort of weird sloping. And the roof is really close. So that means that we can actually use this to just jump. So you basically want to run into the tree and then sort of once you get as high as you can, just uh, tap the jump button and aim yourself to those uh, bricks on the roof. So I'll try this now. Wow, first shot. Incredible. So there you go. <laughs> That's been passed a few times to be made harder, um, but it, it is still possible as you can see. All right, so we get some more Homeward Bones and oops, I really don't understand these controller, motion controller emotes, but okay, so... Uh, we're not going to go into Firelink Shrine just yet. Instead, we're going to circle around the roof. And there's a crystal lizard, a regular treasure crystal lizard, not the giant one. Uh, this crystal lizard is waiting for us back here. All right. So just hop back here and then don't let it run away from you too far. Two, R1. Oh, got to do a third. All right. We get some twinkling titanite from this guy. Great. Okay, now we can head into Firelink Shrine from the roof. Um, but again, there is more to the roof. We just don't have access to it yet. And you won't be able to have access to it until you get the uh, the tower key. The tower key, I think, costs 20,000 souls or 30,000. Uh, I don't recommend buying it anytime soon. It's kind of a waste for now. Um, but very important in here uh, on these rafters, be very, very careful. You want to come over here. And then there's a corpse on this uh, little balcony rafter here. This has an Estus shard. And the Estus Shard is used to uh, increase the efficiency, or sorry, Estus Shards increase the amount of Estus Flasks you can carry to a maximum of 15. And then there's a different item that increases the proficiency, or however much your Estus Flasks heal or restore FP. That's a different item. But this is an easy, early way to get a uh, Shard pretty early. Okay, so uh, before I walk any further, I want to explain the trading system of Dark Souls 3. If you've played any of the Souls games, um, I guess Bloodborne doesn't have this. I'm thinking about it. But Dark Demon Souls, Dark Souls 1, Dark Souls 2, Dark Souls 3, they all have a trading system with a crow, and Snuggly the Crow returns from Dark Souls 1 for Dark Souls 3. The nest is actually on top of the roof, but you can uh, trade here if you like. The, the nest still works. So once you walk towards the nest, Snuggly will start speaking to you, 
and then all you gotta do is just drop an item. Um, there is a table that I will link. You have to drop specific items and then you will get specific items in return. Um, I'll link the table in the description, but the first thing you should trade here is a Homeward Bone. And the reason for that is because uh, you get bracers for them. So you get the call over uh, emote as well as the iron bracelets. And this is part of the Solaire of Astora armor set. All of the pieces you get from Snuckly the Crow trades. Um, yeah, let me just double check here what the other Snuggly Dark Souls 3. Uh, I don't know if I have anything good right now. Yeah, there's so many things. Uh, no. No, that's really all I got right now. Um, okay, so we're not done yet. Walk over here. This is an illusory wall. Unfortunately, unlike Demon Souls, illusory walls in the soul in the Dark Souls games don't shimmer. Uh, so you just kind of gotta whack them and then find out. Gotta mess around to find out. Okay, then you wanna drop off here, and then there's a chest over here with the covetous silver serpent ring, which increases the amount of souls that you get from enemies. So you'll notice in Dark Souls three, you have four ring slots, unlike Demon Souls and Dark Souls 1's two ring slots. So this is carried over from Dark Souls 2, you get more rings. Uh, don't forget to equip your armor again. Right, okay. Great. And then that's kind of it for like the hidden little treasures. All right, so we're gonna drop back down here into the shrine, and then I will sort of escort you around the NPCs. So there is an NPC in this throne right here, this little guy. His name is Ludlith of Corland. And Ludlith of Corland is the only one of the Lords of Cinder who has answered the call, or the, the the bell's toll. And he sort of gives you the mission to go find the rest of the Lords and bring them to Firelink Shrine. And so, spoiler alert, they're all bosses. So you're gonna have to kill them. <laughs> but um, you basically bring their remains here and then you can access the end game. Uh, very similar to Dark Souls 1 with the souls of the, f of the four lords or whatever. Um, but the other thing that Lilith of Coraline does is, one, he gives you a lot of lore. Um, but number two is, after you defeat the Curse Rotted Greatwood, which will be, I guess, part three of the walkthrough, um, you will get an item called the Transposing Kiln. And the Transposing Kiln should be given to Lilith, and then he will allow you to craft boss weapons using boss souls. So... Be on the lookout for that, and then bring it to him, and then you can craft those weapons. Um, so, uh, you can talk to him, he'll give you some lore. Um, and if he's ever sleeping, try to listen to him. He has some pretty sad story uh, in his dreams. Okay, so, back here, here's the Firekeeper. Uh, she allows you to level up. We'll do that in a moment. Um, but for now, we'll keep exploring. Oh, also right here, this is Hawkwood. Um, Hawkwood is basically this game's crestfallen uh, warrior. He gives you the collapse emote, um, but he's pretty different from the other crestfallen warriors from the other games because he actually has a, a quest. He has a full quest line and a full story. Uh, it requires a fair bit of grinding, so I don't think I'll get to it in the walkthrough, but uh, just look it up if, if you'd like to check out his quest line. You need it for the platinum. Um, okay, so this is the Shrine Handmaiden, and the Shrine Handmaiden is just a permanent vendor. Um, and every time you pick up um, someone's ashes, there are sort of specific items scattered around the world. There's generally like one in each major area, but every time you pick up uh, some ashes, you can give them to the handmaiden, and then um, more items will be added to her shop. So every time you find ashes, bring them to the maiden, and you'll get more items. Like I said, the tower key is here for 20,000 souls. Do not buy it yet. It's not worth buying. Um, I will say repairing in Dark Souls 3 is different than Dark Souls 1 and Demon Souls. You will notice that underneath your weapon and shield, both your left hand and right hand uh, equipment, there are red bars underneath them. And that is basically the integrity of the weapon. Weapons and pretty much everything else automatically repairs at bonfires, unless it's broken. If it is completely broken, you need to return to a blacksmith or use repair powder. Um, yeah, so just keep that in mind. You don't have to worry about like finding a blacksmith to repair your weapons all the time or purchasing something to repair them at bonfires. It's automatic. Okay, so that is the handmaiden. 
And then our good buddy, Andre of Astora, returns from Dark Souls 1. Pretty incredible. Um, and Andre has a really big menu. Um, so infusions um, are available right out the gate. There's no need for embers in Dark Souls 3. You find gems throughout the world at different times, and some enemies drop them, um, and then you can use those to infuse your weapons. Uh, you can also allot your Estus with Andre. So this is what I was telling you about before, or telling you about before. So I'm just gonna go all regular Estus for now. And then we can give him the shard that we picked up to reinforce our Estus flask. And then that gives us a maximum of five for now. And again, 15 is the, the total max. So I'm gonna go ahead and re infuse my, uh, my weapon here. I'm gonna infuse it with the fire gem that we started with. And the reason I'm doing this is because there are enemies in um, Highwall of Lothric, the next area, that are pretty weak to fire. Okay, great. So I think that's it for Andre for now. Um, yeah, we don't have to worry about repairing anything. Okay, and then um, there's not a, a lot left here in Firelink, but I should explain things. So as you adventure around Lothric, the world of Dark Souls 3, you will discover various NPCs throughout the world. And many of them will return to Firelink as long as you ask them to, or some just sort of do automatically. Uh, most of them you kind of have to like free from some sort of confinement or prison or something like that. Uh, but they will all sort of appear around Firelink Shrine uh, once they do. Some come and go. Vendors will stay here forever pretty much. Um, but the more transient folks who are adventuring throughout the world, they will stay here. One of those who we will meet in the next part of the walkthrough is Yol of Londor. He's like a pilgrim. He will stand right here. And then at some point, a mysterious woman named Yuria of Londor, she will appear here. And then uh, your different spell vendors, such as Cornix, the pyromancy vendor, I believe he sits here. Um, I don't know if anybody goes here. Can't really remember. Um, there is a dark magic vendor. She either sits here or over, I guess here. Yeah, this is, I forget her name, but she's the dark miracle vendor. Um, Orbeck of Vinheim, he's the sorcery vendor. I believe he goes here. And then the miracle vendor is a woman who we will meet in part three, I guess. Uh, she sits here. Okay, so I guess that's kind of it for Firelink Shrine. Um, you may be wondering, hey, where the hell do I go next? The Cemetery of Ash is pretty empty um, and I've done everything. And that's because in Dark Souls 3, the world is not completely connected like in Dark Souls 1. Think of the Cemetery of Ash and Firelink Shrine like the Northern Undead Asylum, um, in that you have to sort of warp away from it into the real rest of the game, I should say. It's not the real world versus fake world, nothing like that. Um, but you do have to warp away. So at this bonfire here, you get the travel uh, option to go to the High Wall of Lothric. And then from here on out, every single bonfire uh, has teleporting. So you don't need to about you don't need to worry about like placing the Lord Vessel or anything to unlock teleportation or actually just getting the Lord Vessel I guess or just defeating or seeing smell or whatever. Um, teleporting is unlocked from the start, similar to Dark Souls Three, Bloodborne, and uh, Sekiro I guess. Um, yeah, but you do need to warp to the High Wall of Lothric from Firelink Shrine in order to sort of start the game off, um, you know, right away, or uh, for real. Uh, that said, you do have um, a storage box sort of right here, right away. Uh, you don't have to worry about that. And you can also burn an undead bone shard and you find these scattered throughout the world and that increases your uh, the amount of healing that your Estus flasks do. One thing before we leave, we should really level up. Almost forgot to do that. You have to level up with the Firekeeper. You can kill her, she resurrects, um, but you always have to uh, level up with her. Let's go that and then like i said we're going to be doing a primarily strength base build so i will level up to 16 uh, with 15 vigor which is life 13 endurance which is stamina um yeah so vitality increases equipment load um the stats are a little bit more spread out in this game uh, but for the most part they're kind of the same from the previous ones okay so we will end part one of the walkthrough here and then in part two, we will venture to the High Wall of Lothric and take down the Vort of the Boreal Valley. That'll be it for this one. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave a comment. I'll do my best to help you out. If you're looking for more guides for Dark Souls 3, please subscribe to the channel so you get alerted when new guides go live. 
If you're interested in supporting the channel monetarily, please consider becoming a channel member by clicking the blue join button below this video. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter and on Twitch, and as always, I'll speak Johnny Cage. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.